current events, Bible prophecy, the ancient past. How does it all fit together? Find out now. This is Pictures of the End. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Tim Rumsey, and you are listening to Pictures of the End. We're going to do something a little bit different in today's program. I want to share some of the experiences that I've had in my life that have helped me to understand and realize, uh, first of all, that God is real. And secondly, not only is God real, but he is a loving God that can be trusted, that genuinely wants the best for our, us and for our lives. And um, these experiences go back uh, quite a ways in my life, some of them. Others are very recent. But I hope that you can be encouraged and perhaps look at your life and um, recognize the ways that God has been uh, at work in your life, the ways that he has been leading you or trying to lead you. And I know for myself that one of the most effective and powerful things that uh, can encourage and strengthen me in my walk as a Christian is to hear other people share what God has done in their life. So I'm hoping that these stories today will help you as well. There's a great book called The Desire of Ages, and it is a commentary on the life of Christ. On page 347, we read this, Our confession of God's faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old, but that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. Every individual has a life distinct from all others and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him, marked by our own individuality. So these stories that I'm sharing, you know, they're my stories. And uh, some of you may connect with certain of the stories and others you may say, okay, what's the big deal there? But... Um, as we look back on how God has, has been at work, uh, not just in the world, but in our lives, it is good to remember these things. You know, when the children of Israel, the Israelites passed through the Jordan River as they were finally coming into the promised land, God told Joshua to tell them to take 12 stones from that riverbed, one man from each tribe, and they erected a monument there on the shores of the Jordan River, or the banks of the Jordan River, as a reminder, so that they would not forget how God had led them in the past. And it is important, it's good for us, to remember how God has been at work in our lives. And uh, you may be listening right now and thinking, well, God's never worked in my life. Uh, I have nothing to share. And if that's your... Um, perspective you're feeling on your life, I encourage you to just, uh, first of all, say a prayer and say, Lord, I don't feel like you are at work in my life. I don't recognize it. Uh, nothing has seemed to indicate that you care. But if you're real, I pray that you will reveal yourself to me and show me how you're at work in my life. I encourage you to pray that simple prayer and God will show you. I'll start with a couple of stories from when I was quite a young child. Uh, we grew up in Denver. I grew up in Denver. Um, and there was a great blizzard. Well, there were several blizzards during the years that we lived there. But the one I'm thinking of is, I believe, in 1982. And it was around Christmas time. And a, a large blizzard blew through. And uh, really, I forget how deep it was. It was several feet deep. And as happens with blizzards, the wind blew the snow into great drifts. And on the top of our house, we had uh, this great drift on one end of the house, and it just happened to be over our open carport, which was attached to the house just outside the kitchen and the dining room. Well, it was um, one of those nights just before Christmas. Our family was watching the old silent movies, uh, the... Uh, you know, the family movies you could take, the uh, the 8 millimeter reel-to-reel -reel movies. And um, so there's not a lot to listen to other than that whirring of the uh, projector. And we were sitting there in the living room eating popcorn. 
And all of a sudden, uh, my father jumped up, grabbed the car keys, ran outside, backed our uh, little Toyota, forget what kind it was, but it was a Toyota, backed that out from under the carport, parked it in the driveway, ran back in the house, and I don't know exactly how long uh, elapsed after that. In my mind, as a you know five or six-year-old, uh, it was just a few seconds. But that carport came crashing down uh, just minutes after my father had heard the creaking and backed the car out. Well, <laughs> my mom screamed. I had never heard my mom scream before, so I screamed. And my sister then screamed, and uh, in my mind, the whole house was going to come crashing down. It didn't, of course. It was just the cardport uh, out there that had fallen under the weight of the snow. Now, in retrospect, we should have cleared the snow off of the roof. And the same is true spiritually. God promises to make our sins as white as snow. God will do this, but we often do not really accept that forgiveness and believe that it is for us. We continue to hold the guilt and the fear and the anger, whatever it may be, that is separating us from God and from other people. When we do this, our sins pile up just as the snow drifted onto our carport, and they often come crashing down destructively on us and cause great damage. When we ask for forgiveness, believe God's promises and clear the snow off of the roof. So I want to encourage you, uh, if there are things that you are holding on to in your life, and, um, you know, they're weighing you down like that snow was weighing down our carport. It may be a grudge. It may be hurt feelings. It may be uh, something that somebody has done to you at some point in your life, you know, a genuine hurt or injustice. Ask God for the gift of forgiveness. Ask God for uh, his grace and his strength to uh, move forward. And uh, he will do that. And, you know, God wants to take these things uh, from our lives that we do not have to continue carrying them as burdens. Now, another experience I had a few years after this, we had now moved to Nebraska, and uh, our church there had uh, what we called Pathfinders. It's kind of like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts put together. You do lots of camping and activities and, and things like this. Well, we were on a camp out or on our way to a camp out down in Kansas. And if you've ever driven through Kansas, you know it's pretty flat out there. Uh, but this particular reservoir where the campery or the campsite was, was down on the banks of this uh, reservoir. And surprisingly for Kansas, there was actually some cliffs uh, just as you drop down into this campsite area. And there were some switchbacks on the road there over just the last quarter mile or so, and you could actually look out uh, of your vehicle and look down on the buildings just uh, beside you there. Well, here's a 15-passenger van full of uh, 7th and 8th graders, and, uh, you know, you've been in the vehicle for a couple of hours, you're about ready to get out, and you start hitting these switchbacks, and we started asking these silly questions like, would you rather have the brakes go out of the van right now or would you rather have the steering go out? And we each gave our answer and we laughed. Ha, 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 isn't this funny? Well, we got down off of these switchbacks and a few hundred yards more, we found the general camping area. Uh, our leader driving the van pulled forward and then put it in reverse to position the van right where we needed it. And as he turned the steering wheel, after putting it in reverse, that steering wheel just continued to spin and spin and spin, and the front tires did not move. Now, it took us all a moment or two to realize what was happening, and then things got very quiet in the van. And uh, I don't know exactly what had happened. Something, obviously, in the steering column had snapped. We realized at that moment, and I realized in a new way at that moment in my life, that uh, God is real and that he had sent his angels to protect this van full of rowdy and obnoxious 7th and 8th graders on their way down to a campery. You know, God uh, does a lot of things in a lot of our lives that we don't uh, recognize, that we don't um, give him credit for. And uh, maybe you've had some experiences like this where you've known absolutely that God is watching out for you, that God is caring for you. And uh, maybe, I think this is probably true for all of us, we've had experiences where we didn't really recognize that God was at work there. 
Another lesson here is to let God steer your life. And this is a lesson that I'm continuing to learn slowly, that my greatest fulfillment and safety in life depends on my willingness to trust God's guidance and follow his leading. Of course, the extent to which I or any of us will trust God to hold the steering wheel is the extent to which he can use us effectively. Uh, So my encouragement, again, is to just trust God. uh, Let him guide you and lead you and steer your life, and he will do that. Another a story that happened much more recently, uh, as long as we're talking about vehicles, this was just a few years ago, and uh, my wife and I were driving in our minivan with our four children also with us, and we were in downtown Kansas City, and uh, like most large cities, the uh, highway there, the interstate, had multiple lanes of traffic, and we were driving in... Um, the second lane from the left. I think there were three lanes there. And I was driving and had my left hand on the steering wheel and I was kind of, well, I was talking with my wife and so, you know, kind of turned that way. My head was turned over to the passenger seat talking with her. And as I was driving through these winding, busy uh, interstate uh, miles, winding through the middle of Kansas City here, as I was talking with my wife, all of a sudden a car began to pass us from my blind side on the left side. And as this car passed us, it suddenly swerved into our lane. Now my head is turned toward my wife, and as that car swerved into our lane, uh, our van, uh, the steering wheel moved to the right, and just as the car passed and swerved back into its proper lane, uh, the steering wheel in our van turned back to the left. And my wife watched this whole thing because she was looking at me and of course she could see this car passing us. She could see it swerve and then she could see it go back into the passing lane. And she asked me after thinking about it for a moment, she said, how did you know that car was coming? And I paused and I said, I didn't know that that car was coming. And she said, how did you know to turn the steering wheel? And I paused again and I said, I didn't turn the steering wheel. Now, my hand was on the steering wheel the whole time, but uh, this, is, this is the honest truth. Uh, I felt that wheel turn to the right and then back to the left, just as that car swerved into our lane. And as we both realized what had happened and that God had sent his angel to guide our minivan as that car swerved into our lane, we got very quiet there because we realized that, uh, you know, these promises in the Bible are true. Uh, God will send his angels when we ask for protection, when we ask for his His guidance. Now, that doesn't always mean that he always prevents bad things from happening. But that day he did send his angel, and we were very, very thankful for that. Uh, so, once again, um, many of us have these experiences uh, a lot more than we realize. On that particular day, our eyes were opened, and we recognized how God was leading and guiding and protecting us. Now, uh, I have a few more stories that I want to share with you. We'll do that when we come back from the break. So don't go away. We'll be right back. You're listening to Pictures of the End. Over 3,000 years ago, God gave his people a blueprint, revealing the mysteries of salvation. Today, the sanctuary message retains its potency and power. What does the sanctuary and the Ark of the Covenant reveal about Satan's final deceptions, the order of events in the second coming, and how to experience righteousness by faith? The Shadow of His Wings is a short book and video series that takes a fascinating and compelling look at the sanctuary message for today. Topics include righteousness by faith, how to overcome sin and temptation, the Ark of the Covenant, the Most Holy Place, the Second Coming, the Seal of God, and the Mark of the Beast. To order this and other Bible study resources, go to www.pathwaytoparadise.org. That's www.pathwaytoparadise.org.
Welcome back. You are listening to Pictures of the End, and I'm sharing today some of the experiences I've had in my life where I have recognized that God is at work in my life. Some of these stories are stories of protection. Others are stories of guidance and and, uh, leading or just transformation of attitude, uh, which is usually the biggest miracle of all. But uh, let me share a couple of more, a, a couple additional experiences here. Uh, this one comes from uh, the years that I was uh, in college. It was after my sophomore year, and I was spending the summer as a boys' counselor at a summer camp. This was up in the Black Hills. Now, I had discovered very quickly during my time there that I didn't really care to be a boys' counselor, but here I was. I was, I was committed for the summer. And so I did my best to uh, stick it out and have a good attitude, but I could recognize week after week my attitude was slipping. And uh, by the time the midpoint came, halfway through the summer, uh, I just needed to get away for a day and uh, have some time alone. Well, I had a day off, and so I loaded up my car, got my backpack with, uh, you know, a few snacks, and uh, almost as an afterthought, I threw my Bible into the car, and uh, off I went to find a good hiking trail. Well, I found one and uh, started hiking, and... uh, just was in a pretty sour attitude that day. I, I hate to admit it, but I was. And at one point on that hike, I remember I was trying to jump across a creek and my foot slipped on a wet rock and I kind of sprained my ankle. And I debated, should I go back or keep going? But I just really wanted to get out in the wilderness for a while. So I continued going. I'd been hiking for about an hour and a half or so. And um, all of a sudden, a thunderstorm came sweeping up on me and maybe it had been building. I just didn't recognize it because my thoughts were all inward and, you know, I wasn't really looking around like I should have been. At any rate, here came this uh, very intense thunderstorm with all, you know, everything, lightning, wind, even hail in addition to the rain. And uh, where are you going to go? Well, I had just hiked into uh, a campground. Again, this is an hour and a half from my car, so I'm a long ways away. And there is absolutely nowhere to hide here in this campground except for an outhouse. Now, there was no way I was going to sit inside the outhouse, but I did curl myself up under the eaves of the outhouse, and I waited for that storm to pass, feeling very sorry for myself, feeling feeling very discouraged. And I just want to say this here, that discouragement is one of the devil's most effective ways of dragging uh, all of us down. As I sat under the eaves of the outhouse here, I started, I pulled out my Bible after I'd eaten something, and I started reading from the story of Elijah, this prophet in the Old Testament. And he went through a period in his life where he was very discouraged. Now, he had just experienced some tremendous spiritual victories on Mount Carmel. This was the story where the fire came down from heaven after he doused the altar with water and it burned everything up, not just the sacrifice, but the rocks and the trench and the water he had dumped on it. Everything's burned up. The people bow down and say, you know, the Lord is God. And so Elijah, uh, and of course, God working through Elijah, gains a, a tremendous victory that day over all the false prophets and over all the apostasy that had been going on. And so here is Elijah, you know, like this, this s- spiritual superhero and this national superstar. And Queen Jezebel who was married to Ahab. Uh, Both of them had brought on a lot of this apostasy and sin. She sends a message to Elijah and she says, uh, mark my words, basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but she says, you're a dead man. You're as good as dead. I'm going to kill you for what you've done. Well, Elijah gives in to discouragement and fear at this point, and he starts to run. And as I read this story in the Bible, I started identifying with Elijah because I was kind of on the run that day too. I was trying to just get away. I was feeling sorry for myself. And in Elijah's story, he runs for 40 days. So maybe I had hiked for four hours. (laughs) He runs for 40 days and finally finds himself in the mouth of a cave on uh, Mount Horeb. This is the same mountain where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments centuries before. And as Elijah hides in this little cave or this cleft of the rock, a terrible storm passes by. First there's fire and then there's a tornado and then there's a rainstorm with hail. Just as I read this, I was identifying with Elijah because here I am stuck out in this storm as well. And again, I just want to come back to this point that discouragement 
is such an effective tool that the devil uses on us. And we all fall to this. Okay, None of us are immune from discouragement. And uh, we need to be so careful, especially as Christians, that we do not allow ourselves to give in to discouragement. Because when we are discouraged, every other temptation has a much stronger sway on us. And we will go places and do things that we never would have if we weren't under this spell of discouragement. Uh, There's another book called Prophets and Kings, which is a great commentary on some of the Old Testament stories. Uh, And it says this about Elijah, while under the inspiration of the Almighty, he had stood the severest trial of faith. But in this time of discouragement, with Jezebel's threat sounding in his ears and Satan still apparently prevailing through the plotting of this wicked woman, he lost his hold on God. And again, uh, when we fall to discouragement, when we get under that dark cloud of despair, we too often lose our hold on God. And I was in danger of doing that this day on my hike. Uh, I was I was in danger of losing my hold on God. Going back to Elijah's story, this, this statement in the book Prophets and Kings goes on and says, Forgetting God, Elijah fled on and on until he found himself in a dreary waste alone. So here I was. I'm identifying with Elijah. I am. I have run away. I'm trying to get away from the situation. I'm under this cloud of discouragement. There's a great storm outside. And as I continued reading Elijah's story, I, I read how God comes to Elijah. The storm passes, and then God speaks to Elijah in a in a still small voice, and He encourages Elijah. He assures him that he is not alone. There are seven thousand other people in Israel then have not bowed their knee to the idols. They are true to God. And God gives him encouragement. And then he says, now get up and go back. You have work to do. And as I read this story of Elijah, there was a transformation that happened in me. And I can't explain it other than the promise that God uh, works miracles through the power of his word. And as I read how God spoke to Elijah, as I read how he brought a transformation to that prophet so many centuries ago. Uh, The same God worked with the same power in my own heart. And by the time I finished reading Elijah's story, uh, my attitude had completely changed. I was not feeling discouraged. Uh, I was not feeling frustrated and, uh, you know, just self-focused with all those negative emotions and thoughts I had before. And I I was actually energized. I was ready to go back and finish this summer of counseling. And uh, it's been decades now, but I remember this day uh, there in the Black Hills as um, an experience in my life where I really realized that God is real, that he cares about me individually, and that there is power in the word of God to, to change me to change who I am, you know, to take my, my emotions, my thoughts, whatever it may be that are pulling me away from God. And there is power in that word to make me a different person. So again, I want to give you encouragement and to give you a challenge that if you feel like you're under a dark cloud right now in your life, if you feel like you are separated from God or even that God doesn't care, or maybe you feel like you're serving God alone, which Elijah kind of felt that way, I just want to give you encouragement that uh, God is still there, that he is still guiding you and caring for you. And maybe you've been on the run from God for a long time. You know, a lot of us run from God for years, even most of our lives. And yet God is still there and he is still trying to draw us back to him. And I want to encourage you that wherever you are in that journey, um, if, if, if you find If you know that you're running like I was, like Elijah was, listen for God's voice. Um, He is still there. And um, just as he spoke to Elijah in that still small voice, he wants to speak to you with a still small voice as well. He wants to transform who you are, how you're thinking, how you're feeling, and uh, give you a completely new attitude and outlook on life, just like he gave to me. Now, I'll share one more story. And this happened just uh, actually a couple of days ago. Earlier this week, uh, we uh, are working on a French drain on our property, and uh, I was working on this, and I put my cell phone into a fleece pocket that did not have a zipper. And here's the first moral for this story. (laughs) Never work on a French drain or anything where you're doing dirt work 
and uh, if you don't have a way to zip up your cell phone. Well, I was working. My kids were out there with me, and we had uh, started to fill the trench in with gravel, and then we laid down the drain tile, that, uh, that black corrugated pipe, and um, then we put some weed guard over that, and I was making my way down this drain, kind of wrapping the weed guard around the pipe and so forth to try to keep the mud and the dirt out. And i um, been doing that for quite a while. We got it all covered. We dumped a few loads of gravel on top, and uh, by that time it was dark out, so we went in. And I reached into my pocket once I got inside to pull out my cell phone, and you can guess what happened. <laughs> there was no cell phone. And I went and looked in the truck. Uh, I went and looked in the tractor. I went and looked everywhere I could think of. And I just had this pit in my stomach. I bet it's under some rock. I bet it's under some gravel in that drain somewhere. I took my wife's phone, tried to uh, walk up and down the drain, listening for my phone as I called it. But of course, I had it on vibrate, so there was no way you were going to hear it. Uh, my dear wife said, it was late by this time, uh, kids have been put in bed. She said, I'm going to go out, I'm going to try to find your phone. And I was not in a great attitude, but uh, I said, there's no way I'm going to make you do that alone. So we both went out together with headlights and shovels, and we ripped up that drain tile, and we started taking the gravel out of the the, uh, the, the drain, uh, the trench there. And to make uh, what seemed like a very long time short, uh, we had taken several loads out, and all of a sudden my wife let out a gasp, and there was my cell phone, unharmed, still uh, powered up, working just like it's supposed to. That's probably the uh, most recent experience here. Well, it happened just yesterday, didn't it? A reminder once again that God cares. You know, it's a small thing. Cell phones are not a big deal in the big scope of life, but God cares about that. And I believe that he works in our lives in these small and the big things so that we can learn to trust him better. And whatever you may be going through, uh, take it to the Lord in prayer. You know, we did pray before we searched for that cell phone. And I believe God led us to find it. And uh, he wants to lead you as well. And I believe he is. Even if you're not aware of it, even if you're not recognizing it, uh, trust that God is directing your life and that he wants to direct it more effectively and more completely than he is right now, but he needs your approval. He needs your okay. He simply needs you to say, Lord, uh, I need your help. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. I want you to direct my life. Uh, Please do that. And he will say, I'm here. Let's go. Well, friends, thanks for listening. I hope these stories have been encouraging for you. And uh, share your stories with somebody else. They'll be encouraged as well. Thanks for joining me and join us again next time for Pictures of the End. You have been listening to Pictures of the End, a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. Pictures of the End is available via your favorite podcast service and also at www.picturesoftheend.com.